Good afternoon, everybody. Um, hopefully, I've seen most of you before. You, most of you have seen me before when I did the little introductory talk when you first got here, while well, certainly the master's students. So I'm Peter Brocklehurst. I'm the director of the Institute for Women's Health. Um, but I'm also an epidemiologist, which is what my training is. I'm an I was an obstetrician and a gynecologist originally. Uh, it's difficult to call yourself an obstetrician when you haven't seen a patient for 20 years. So I'm, I'm predominantly an epidemiologist. So I'm going to be giving a series of talks about epidemiology. I've, I've um, tried to phrase them in ways that don't make it sound too scary. Um, but if essentially I'm giving a series of talks about epidemiology, basic epidemiology. And some of you might feel very familiar and comfortable with this, and others may be coming across this for the first time. So I'll try and take you through it fairly straightforwardly. Uh, today is going to be an overview, and then I will talk in more detail about the specific study designs in subsequent lectures. What goes alongside this, of course, is that we've got a journal club. Uh, and although I can talk about the principles of epidemiology and give you some examples, there's nothing quite like going through a paper of a particular study design and seeing about all the challenges. So by necessity, what I'll be talking about today is quite simplistic. I'll be talking about the basic structures of different study designs. But of course, when it comes to the specifics, they can be really very complicated. And for one study, the selection of the controls might be enormously complicated and complex. And for another study, the selection of the controls is very straightforward. So it very much depends on the individual question that you're trying to ask with the different design. Does that make sense? So I'm going to be talking about the design, but the journal club, where we actually look at papers of different studies, will give you that more in-depth knowledge. The other thing to say as an introduction, I'm not trying to make you all epidemiologists. But no matter what your background is, whether it's basic science or clinical or uh, clinical science, you do need to be aware that everything that we do in terms of research is leading up to, hopefully, ways of improving the care that we provide and improving outcome for patients. So the studies I'm going to be talking about are very much at the patient end. This is clinical epidemiology. I'm not talking about laboratory study design, animal study design, the principles of good design, they still, still apply. But even if you work solely in the laboratory and that's where you're always going to be, it's useful to have some understanding of where all that leads to and to be able to read the literature and begin to understand the, uh, the way that you interpret that information that you're reading. Okay, so today is literally a, a, a rattle through the common study designs, just talking very briefly about the elements of uh, their strengths and their weaknesses, and then as I said, we'll break down the more common study designs in whole lectures devoted to each particular study design where I'll go into more detail. So there's an opportunity to catch up. So, um, so I've called this designing the study, and this doesn't work. Um, yeah. If you say epidemiology, people get upset. Um, so <clears throat> this is what we're going to talk about. I'm going to talk very briefly about the, the role and uh, within medical research of case reports, case series, ecological studies, cross-sectional studies. But most of my talk is going to be about cohort studies, case control studies, and randomized controlled trials. But also in the individual lectures, I'm going to talk about screening studies, studies of population screening. Um, I'm not talking about systematic review and meta-analysis in particular, uh, but if you're interested in that, I can talk about systematic review and meta-analysis as we go through. Perhaps we touch on trials in more detail. So I can easily dismiss case reports and case series. Not because they're not important, but you know what a case report is. Somebody comes across an interesting case, uh, <clears throat> they don't know quite what to do about it, it may be the first time it's ever been reported, they write it out and somebody, uh, people read it and think, oh well if that happens to me, I'll know what it is and I'll know what to do about it. But it doesn't give you any more information, it's, it's simply a, a way of saying there's this new case of blur. So in the early days, you're all forty to remember, but in the early days of HIV, when before we didn't know it was called H HIV, when we used to, even before we used to call it HTLV3, I'm losing you all, I can see now. I remember testing patients for HTLV3, or as we called it, 5 or XL5 at the time. Um, but before that, there were case reports of uh, gay men having um, life-threatening diarrheal illness that couldn't be uh, confirmed what the, the illness was uh, and what it meant. And it was a, a series of case series 
that the picture began to build up that there was a new disease emerging which hadn't been around before. So case reports are important because they make people aware of something, but they're limited in terms of the inferences you can take from them. Now clearly, a number of case reports is a case series. And again, you can get a bit more information from that. Suddenly, there's 20 gay men in San Francisco who all have the same symptomatology. This didn't exist before, there's been a case report, and now there's 20 men over a six month period, all exhibiting the same thing and half of them have died. And suddenly, that's more interesting, it's more important. People become more interested because this is something that's happening more frequently. So case series do have their, their roles, uh, absolutely. Um, we do something in the UK called UCOS, which is the UK Obstetric, Obstetric Surveillance System, where we run a whole series of studies looking at uh, very rare conditions associated with pregnancy. So we've done things like uh, uh, whether you have a heart attack when you're pregnant, what happens to you and the baby. Uh, the, if you have a heart-lung transplant and you get pregnant, what happens to the pregnancy and what happens to you as a consequence of the pregnancy if you've got a heart-lung transplant? Very rare events, only ever reported as case reports, and by having a case series, by collecting every case in the UK over a one, two, three or four year period, you can begin to say something about the prognosis of having a pregnancy with a heart, lung, pancreas and liver transplant, which we do have a few. Um, and so you can begin to provide information for clinicians to talk to patients about the likelihood of success of their pregnancy, to counsel them and say, if you become pregnant, this is the likelihood of success. And also to say, perhaps, um, and if your serum creatinine is this, as in you've got some evidence of renal failure, then your likelihood of having a successful pregnancy is very poor. But if it's this, then your likelihood of having a successful pregnancy is much higher. So we'll allow people to make decisions. So they're not by any means useless, these studies, and they're often dismissed as being uh, relatively irrelevant, but they can be enormously helpful, particularly if it's all you've got. Um, ecological studies are the first type of analytical study that you'll find in this sort of series. Ecological or correlational studies are where you compare data, two types of, two different uh, pieces of data, but not on the individual person level. So here is a graph showing cigarette consumption per capita. These sorts of data usually come from sales, so how many cigarettes were sold in a country per head of population. So it's an average, it's not how many people smoked or how much they smoked. It literally is how many cigarettes were sold in that country. And these are different countries, and you can look at preterm deliveries per uh, thousand births. And you can see that there's an association between cigarette consumption at a population level and the incidence of preterm birth. Yeah? But there's no way you can say smoking causes preterm birth. Because these aren't the same people. You don't, or you, they may be, but you don't know that. You could also put a um, uh, number of televisions owned per household and preterm birth, and the graph would be the other way around because preterm birth is socially conditioned. Yeah? The richer you are, the less likely you are to have a preterm birth. The richer you are, the less, more likely you are to have lots of televisions. You could do it with how many cars are owned. Uh, do you know what I mean? There's no, there's no sense of causality in this. You can associate lots of things with lots of other things. But it's something you can do at your desk with Google. And it's good for generating hypotheses. Because you can look at per capita data event rates either by country or region or, or different things, and it will generate hypotheses which you can then think about testing in other studies. Uh, so particularly for things like environmental exposures, uh, this is sometimes used. Um, so ecological studies are quick, they're cheap, and they're good at generating hypotheses. They're not based on individuals and therefore confounding is a major issue, and I'll come back to what I mean by confounding a bit later, because you're not talking about the same individuals. Cross-sectional studies are different. This is where you take a cross-section of people and you measure exposure and incidence of the disease, or whatever it is you're looking for, the outcome, at the same time. Right? So you just take 250 people, I could take all of you now 
Uh, um, yeah, I'm not sure I'd do the miscarriage thing, but um, I could take you all now, um, look at your some, some exposure, I don't know what that would be, I'm struggling here, and if I could take a blood test from you all, find out whether you've got antibodies to something or other, and then ask you whether you're asthmatic. And I could relate that exposure, those antibodies, to whether you're asthmatic or not. So, an example that's been used, that was used a few years ago, was looking at people who had a miscarriage and comparing those with uh, people who didn't have a miscarriage and seeing who had antibodies to chlamydia to see whether there's an association between chlamydia infection and miscarriage. So, in this instance, women with chlamydia antibodies, 15% had a spontaneous abortion. Women with no chlamydia antibodies, 5% had a spontaneous abortion. Yeah. Is that specifically um, markers that indicate causality? Nope. Nope. So what? So that's so you've got three times there. Three times as many women with chlamydia antibodies have had a, a, a miscarriage than women without chlamydia antibodies. Can you say that chlamydia causes miscarriage? No. Why not? I'm not saying it's the wrong answer, it's the right answer. Of course you can't. But why not? There may be other factors, yeah. No, it's not the percentage is too low. It's a cross-sectional study, so you can't generate. It's a cross-sectional study, so you can't generate causality. Yeah, but why can't you generate causality from cross-sectional studies? No, that's not, no, that's not, that's, yeah, obviously, but there are women with chlamydia who do miscarry and women with chlamydia who don't miscarry. That doesn't mean it's not a risk factor. It's, what you're saying is that this increases the risk of miscarriage if you've got chlamydia. That would be the hypothesis, isn't it? Chlamydia causes miscarriage, but it's not an all or nothing. It will be, there's lots of causes of miscarriage. And this is increasing your risk of miscarriage, having chlamydia. That would be a hypothesis coming from. What this doesn't tell you in a cross-sectional study is whether the chlamydia occurred at some point in relation to the miscarriage where it could convincingly be the cause of it. You're looking at antibodies. This could be exposure 20 years ago, and you've still got the antibodies. But it doesn't mean you've got chlamydia anymore. So how could that be related to the risk of miscarriage? Misca so what's the, what's the risk factor which joins up miscarriage and chlamydia antibody carriage? What basic human experience could be related to both miscarriage and... If I said pregnancy as opposed to miscarriage and chlamydia acquisition, what basic human experience causes those two? Hmm? Sex. Yeah. So the unprotected sex, pregnancy, chlamydia acquisition. So this may just be a marker of sexual behaviour and sexual activity. Chlamydia and the miscarriage may have nothing to do with each other. You, mo you can't have a miscarriage unless you're pregnant. You can't get pregnant unless you have unprotected sex. People, women who have lots of unprotected sex may be more likely, will have, be more likely to get chlamydia. There's all sorts of reasons why you can't in any way assume causality. And that's one of the challenges of, uh, of those cross-sectional studies. Yeah? Uh, so, again, they're quick and cheap. Cheap, relatively. They're quick because you take you measure exposure and outcome at the same time. So you get a group of people and you can do that uh, simultaneously. So you don't have to follow anybody up for weeks, months, years, decades. Um, but there's all sorts of biases. The selection bias, recall bias, confounding, which is a specific sort of bias, and lack of temporal association are all major problems. So lack of temporal association is showing that one thing occurs before the other as opposed to at the same time. And that the temporal association makes sense. I'll come back to selection bias and recall bias, partly in this lecture and partly in subsequent lectures to explain those. Okay, so let's move on. That's a sort of, if by way of introduction, if you like. These are the main, main, major epidemiological study designs. And the first one is a cohort study. So cohort study is two or more groups which are selected based on exposure. So the simplest way to think of this is just as two groups. 
but you can have three, you can have 15 groups. You can, have, you can make this as big as you want. Or you can take a population and divide them into those who are exposed or unexposed. But if you think about it most simply, you've got two groups based on exposure, and that will usually be exposed or not exposed to whatever it is you're interested in as the exposure. And then they are followed up to determine outcome. This is absolute key. This is, this is the difference between cohort studies and case control studies. When you look at, I mean, I did an exercise looking at the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology a few years ago. The number of times these were called the wrong thing in a journal was startling. If you get this right in your head, then you'll know what the strengths and weaknesses of those designs are. But you'll also recognise when you're reading a paper, and you'll think, mm, this, this, isn't, this isn't a case control study, this is actually a case control study. And you'll feel nicely superior. But it also allows you a framework to critique the study design. Because cohort studies and case control studies have very different strengths and weaknesses. So it's important to know what the study design is. So cohorts, based on exposure, followed through to outcomes. It's a straightforward temporal relationship. So you could take a group of, if you want to explore the association between smoking and preterm birth, you take a group of smokers and non-smokers and follow them up and find out what proportion in that group have a preterm birth and what proportion in that group have a preterm birth. Yeah? Simple. Uh, so, cohort studies. We, I did a big cohort study uh, where we recruited uh, 85,000 women uh, in the UK to look at the safety of planned place of birth. Where we wanted to look at whether it was safe for women to plan birth at home, in a midwifery unit, or in a hospital. So we uh, selected these groups based on those exposures, planned birth at home, not actual birth at home, planned birth at home, and then we followed them up and looked at their neonatal morbidity, neonatal mortality, and maternal morbidity. Exposure was where they planned to give birth, and what we're interested in is the safety for the mother and the baby. Yeah? It's, just, it's a very straightforward design. In fact, we had four groups in the end because we had enough. We had over 10,000 in each group of midwifery units. We were able to look at alongside midwifery units, as in those in hospital next to an obstetric unit, and those freestanding midwifery units, which are physically and geographically separate from an obstetric unit. So, terms you may see in the literature prospective and retrospective. What's different about those areas? Yeah. Those areas are exactly the same, aren't they? All that perspective and retrospective means in relation to cohort studies, and this is why talking about a prospective study or a retrospective study doesn't tell you what the study design is. You're still getting your groups based on exposure or not and following them up to an outcome. A prospective study means you identify your cohort based on exposure and then you have to wait for them to develop the outcome. A retrospective cohort study means that you find your groups who are already exposed or unexposed, select them, but the outcomes are already recorded. So the early work on mesothelia mesotheliomas, do you know what that is? That's a rare tumour of the pleural cavity, which is associated with asbestos. Um, we're all based on retrospective cohort studies, because the, the patients had already died. But what they went to all the factories that made asbestos, and they got those people who worked with asbestos, and all those people in the same factories who didn't work with asbestos, or the administrative staff who weren't exposed to asbestos, and then went and pulled out their death records, and find out that this group had died of mesothelioma, and this group hadn't. Still a cohort study, you're selecting your groups based on exposure, and following them up to outcome, even if that follow-up is already completed. This is the most reliable observational study. Observational versus interventional. An interventional study will be a randomized control trial. 
But if you're going to do an observational study, this is the most reliable. It is not always possible or feasible, but if you can do one, it is the most reliable because it's the least susceptible to bias. It's useful to investigate rare exposures. If you're interested in exposure to sheep dip during pregnancy, might be a little bit difficult at UCLH. But you could select women who work in farms who are exposed to sheep dips while they're pregnant from the entire country. Yeah? So you've got a rare exposure. You can get all of those together and then a selected group of people who were not exposed to sheep dip, which might be a slightly easier job. So it's good to get people together who are rare exposures. Uh, that's what I mean by organophosphates. That's... So the selection of the exposed group, how you select them, and what you measure in terms of your exposure will depend on the question that you're asking. And this is where the complexity comes in. And it's almost impossible to say what you should do because it depends on the question that you're asking. So how will the group be found? How will you identify them? If you're interested in the outcome of endometriosis in a cohort study, then you need to define endometriosis. Is that gonna be a clinical definition? Will you require women to have a laparoscopy to have laparoscopically confirmed endometriosis? If that's true and you need women who don't have endometriosis, does that mean they have to have a laparoscopy to exclude endometriosis to make sure that you've got an exposed and an unexposed group who are really exposed and unexposed? So there's all sorts of questions come in. How do you measure the exposure? Clearly, if you can demonstrate a dose response in terms of your exposure, the more exposed you are to something, the more likely you are to get the outcome that increases the likelihood that the exposure causes the outcome, doesn't it? It just makes sense. The more of something you get, the worse your outcome is, that suggests that that actually is causing the outcome. Because you've been, you'll, you may have not noticed, but I've been very careful, I've only talked about associations. Because these are all associations. There is then a judgment about whether this association might be causal, which is something slightly different. So look at smoking, how, I mean, you know, you could say, I mean, I've talked about smokers and non-smokers in the preterm birth example, but what do we mean by smoking? How are we going to get smoking? Is this ever smoked, given up in pregnancy, continuing your pregnancy? How much you smoke? What you smoke? Whether you get any other tobacco exposure? Is it tobacco exposure you're looking for? Is it smoke? You know, there's all sorts of ways of quantifying that exposure so that you can look, at, look for a dose-response effect. And you know, there's no right or wrong way of doing it. If you're getting it from notes, if you're not actually speaking to people, you'll be lucky if you get smoking, non-smoking. If it's in pregnancy, what will it be like, the data for smoking? How complete is it in pregnancy notes? It's terrible, because women know they're not supposed to smoke in pregnancy. I've had women come rushing in from outside to antenatal clinic and then just breathe smoke on over me, and I've gone, so you smoke? And they go, no. <laughs> they know they're not supposed to. So they don't, you know, so if you're relying on records, you'll be lucky to get smoking versus not smoking. But if you're speaking to people, you can get more detail about their smoking habits. And of course, you might want to even quantify that. You want to make, might get some objective measure of their smoking exposure. So in principle, the unexposed group should be as similar as possible to the exposed group, apart from the exposure. Because you want them to be the same, don't you? You don't want all of your unexposed groups to be so dissimilar to the exposed group that there's nothing in common apart, you know, so everything is different. Because then you can't say that there are any differences in outcome due to the differences in exposure. And determination of not exposed status is terribly important. So in the early days of HIV infection in Africa, uh, when there was voluntary, early voluntary testing in antenatal clinics, you'd get women who were HIV positive, but you know, 40 or 50% of women wouldn't be tested. You can't assume that they're HIV negative in areas of high prevalence. So you end up using the women who have been tested and are negative to be the unexposed group, because otherwise you could have quite a lot of exposure in the untested group. So again, you just need to think this through, and when you're reading a paper, think through what, what it's telling you. 
And the source of the unexposed group is really important. So endometriosis is a really good example. Do you know how long it takes for the average woman to get her endometriosis diagnosed? Do you know what endometriosis is? Do you know what endometriosis is? Can you give us an endometrium in your pelvis and your abdomen? Do you know how long it takes to get diagnosed? The clinicians amongst you? Have a guess. The median duration of time for diagnosis. Seven years. Nope. In the, in the UK. Ooh, closer. 17 years. 17 years. And that because, that because you need to get to somebody who can diagnose it. And that step of getting from your GP, from primary care, into secondary care to get a diagnosis is quite a difficult step to negotiate when you've got non-specific symptoms. And we know this for a whole variety of diseases. Getting from primary care to secondary care takes a bit of negotiation sometimes. You know, if you're going with a big cancer on your face, you're going to get in. But when you've got a bit of pelvic pain and, and you know, a bit painful, your period is a bit painful and it's a bit sore when you have sex, you know, the likelihood of your GP referring you in is variable. So clearly, those women who are very articulate and can express themselves clearly will be able to give a history to their GP, which gets them to secondary care much quicker than those women who are not articulate, or don't speak English, or have other ways of not being able to convey the information clearly. And this step in terms of accessing of health, health care is very important. So if you want to do a study comparing endometriosis and no endometriosis, and you want community controls for that, women in the community may not be the same in other ways, other ways which are difficult to measure, than women who have endometriosis diagnosed by hospital staff. And this has been demonstrated. Studies that have used endometriosis, laparoscopically proven endometriosis. If you take controls from the community, or controls from hospital, other hospital departments, where there's been no pathology found, the results are different because of that health-seeking behavior. So not, you know, this won't apply for pregnancy, for example, where everybody gets, most people in this country anyway, get pregnancy care. For some conditions, it may be really important to think through. So let's talk about bias in cohort studies. This is not uh, specific to cohort studies, but I think it's quite but, but important. So I'm going to talk about confounding. Confounding affects all observational studies. So I'll talk about what confounding is. It is a specific form of bias. The reason we get, I would say, get so excited by confounding, but we can do something about confounding. We can adjust for it in the analysis. When I was a junior doctor, I thought when people said they did an adjusted analysis, I thought that, I thought that meant they cheated um, and just sort of mixed around with the figures a bit, but it is a very specific form of analysis, so you can control for confounding. You cannot control analytically for any other form of bias. So this is why confounding is a specific form of bias, which we have to understand. But I'll talk about loss to follow-up and non-participation. So a confounding factor is a characteristic, a variable, a piece of information, which is related to both the exposure and the outcome that you're interested in. So here's a diagram, a very, very simple diagram, but a very effective diagram if you keep this in your head. What we're obviously always interested in is the relationship between the exposure and the outcome. Yeah? So we measure the exposure, we measure the outcome, and we hope that there's an association of what we're looking for. A confounder is something which is related to both the exposure and the outcome, which can interfere with the relationship between one and the other. Now clearly, a confounder has to be related to both, otherwise it wouldn't be a confounder. If it was only related to the exposure, but made no difference to the outcome, who cares? It doesn't make any difference. Your relationship between the exposure and the outcome will be unaltered, so it has to be associated with both. So take alcohol and preterm birth. There's a lot of interest in this in the 90s. Smoking might be a confounder, mightn't it? Women who drink during pregnancy, drink alcohol during pregnancy, particularly more than just a very small amount, are much more likely to be smokers. Smoking is associated with preterm birth. So if you're interested in the association between alcohol use and preterm birth, smoking could be a potent confounder. 
So if you find a relationship between alcohol use and preterm birth, it may all be due to differences in smoking between those women who drink a lot and those women who don't drink at all. Does that make sense? But it has to be because smoking is related to both the exposure and the outcome. Um, that's what I've just said. So that's what confounding is. What can we do about it? Well, this is what, don't get hung up on this. This is what used to be done a lot before we had computers that did things quickly. Um, so it used to be quite complex to do this statistical analysis. So you'll still see references to this in contemporary literature, but it's usually from people who are older than me. Because um, I remember doing an adjusted analysis where you used to have to write the code, then you'd go and have lunch, you'd come back, um, you'd go to a couple of lectures, and if you're lucky by five o'clock, you'd actually run. Um, uh, and now you can do that in you know, a fraction of a millisecond on much more complex data. But it was quite difficult. So other methods were used to try and control for confounding. These methods are still sometimes used when there's something which is such a strong confounder that you can't adjust for it. And I'll come back to that. So imagine HIV uh, positivity um, in relation to pregnancy outcome. In the early days of HIV infection in pregnancy in the UK, Almost all women who are HIV positive, diagnosed HIV positive in the UK, were drug users, were injecting drug users. Now that's obviously associated with a bad outcome of pregnancy. But you can't remove the effect of drug use in pregnancy if everybody who's HIV positive is a drug user and virtually everybody who's HIV negative is not a drug user. Because actually, they're so closely associated with each other that you can't separate drug use and HIV positive status. Does that make sense? So one way you could do it is to say, well, we'll restrict this to only drug using HIV positive and drug using HIV negative women. So they'll all have a bad outcome because they're drug users. And so the difference should, if carefully controlled, be due to the HIV infection. Or you can do something called matching. So for every HIV positive woman who's a drug user, She's then matched to an HIV negative woman who's a drug user. So at the end of the study, you've got 60% HIV positive women are drug users and 60% HIV negative women are drug users. And so you've cancelled out the effect of drug use. I mean, that's incredibly simplistic. Is that, you know, what drug use, how much drug use, how long it's been going on for, all of those things need to be taken into account. But those are, that's what restriction and matching is. And you might see that referred to uh, in the literature. But now only used when something is so overlapped. So the overlap between the exposure that you're interested in and the confounder is almost complete. Because there's otherwise there's no point in doing it. Because with modern statistical techniques, you can control for these factors. And of course, what you can't do when you restrict or match is say anything. You can't quantify then the effects of drug use on adverse pregnancy outcome. Because you control for it all. Follow-up, immensely important in cohort studies. If there's differential loss to follow-up, results cannot, can be very difficult to interpret. So you've got a group, so let's take these HIV positive and HIV negative women. Which ones are going to be easier to follow up? Maybe. Well, if it, if it was associated with drug users, it may be very difficult to follow up. Now, pregnancy is fine, because you can probably get a pregnancy outcome. But if it's something unrelated to pregnancy that you need to follow these people up for two years, you may lose most of the, drug use, the HIV positive women because there's so many drug users amongst them and retain all the HIV negative women because most of them are not drug users. And then you've, en you've ended up with, so what can you say when you compare the results of those you've been able to follow up when you've got a big differential loss to follow up? So in general, cohort studies are strong because they're the least susceptible to bias. It's a sweeping statement. It depends on the question and how the study is designed. But in general, they're least susceptible to bias. There is no recall bias in prospective studies. Recall bias is where you ask a, a person, a woman, to give you data from previously. Uh, so there's some nice studies looking at um, over-the-counter medicines, so aspirin, paracetamol, anything you wear over-the-counter in pregnancy and fetal abnormalities. If you ask a woman with a fetal abnormality whether she took any of the medicine counter drugs, 
she will do her very best to remember every pill she ever took during that pregnancy because she thinks it might be caused of abnormality. If you ask a woman without a fetal abnormality, whose baby's healthy, whether she took over the counter drugs in pregnancy, what incentive is her for her to remember every little paracetamol or aspirin she took? So what will that tell you? That will tell you over-the-counter drugs are associated with fetal abnormalities. And it's all recall bias. Because women are giving information more completely in one group compared with another. It's very potent sometimes. So if you do a prospective study based on exposure, you don't get any recall bias because you're collecting the, the exposure before the outcome occurs. So you're not getting a different response depending on the outcome. Uh, the weaknesses are, in general, these are expensive because you need to, not always, but retrospective co uh, co-authors are, are cheaper, and they're relatively expensive. They're time-consuming if you need to follow up people for a long time. The big cohort studies that look at cardiovascular mortality, uh, the Framingham Heart Study, has been going on for you know, decades and decades and decades. Of course, if you can get one of those, then as an academic, you're, you're made for life. But if you can get to retirement, and then you're the next person who will keep on getting to retirement. We're just starting a new birth cohort study in the UK. We're recruiting pregnant women and we're following up their babies for the rest of their lives. That'll keep a few people going for a while. In the job. Loss to follow up, important. Participation bias. Go back to the HIV question again. HIV positive women, you approach them and say, we want you to take part in a study where we want to look at the impact of HIV on your, on your long-term health. Uh, how many will say yes? Well, say 50% say, say yes. And then you take a group of HIV negative women and say we want to look at the impact of HIV, positive, HIV positivity on long term health and we want you to be a normal control. So will it be 50%? Might be more, might be less. There's no incentive for them to take part because there's no benefit from them. But they may be more incentivized to take part because they're not living chaotic lifestyles. I'm going back to the, you know, when it was associated with. Uh, drug use, particularly in Scotland. So you can find differential participation rates, which may affect the generalizability of your findings. And it's poor for rare outcomes. So the reason that my cohort study of planned place of birth was 85,000 is because pregnancy outcomes in low-risk women in the UK, adverse pregnancy outcomes, are very rare. Really, really, really rare. So we needed huge numbers of women to be able to detect any difference in adverse pregnancy outcomes. Okay, we're still awake. It's awfully warm in here, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Case control studies. So this is the contrast. This is the other main observational study design. So this is where the difference between cohort studies and case control studies needs to get firmly locked in your head, and you'll get this right. So case control studies are where two or more groups are selected based on outcome. And then you look back at the exposures. So these are always retrospective. Some people do refer to prospective case control studies. What they mean is they're selecting the outcomes prospectively over a period of time. But they're always looking back at the exposure. So cohort studies select on exposure, look forward to outcome. Case control studies select on outcome and look back at exposure. And the reason they get confused is, take, take the example we've been talking about, HIV positive women, HIV negative women, adverse pregnancy outcome. The cases are HIV positive women, the controls are HIV negative women, why isn't this a case control study? It's not, it's a cohort study. That's where the confusion arises because people talk about cases and non-cases in different ways, clinically and so on and so forth. But it doesn't, the study design is still a cohort study. Yeah? So, case control studies. So again, if you're interested in the association between smoking and preterm birth in a case control study, you would take women who've had a preterm birth, women who have not had a preterm birth, and look back and see what proportion of them were smokers. Um, I'll go into more detail in this when I talk, I've, I've got a whole talk you'll have on case control studies. That's not supposed to scare you off, by the way. Uh, a whole talk on case control studies. They are relatively quick and cheap compared with cohort studies because, of course, the data is always retrospective. So you're going back, you're either asking women 
you're going back to notes, you're going back to some other source of data. So it's already happened. Cohort studies were good for rare exposures. This is good for rare outcomes, because you can get all the women who've got this particular outcome, and then choose a group of women who haven't got that outcome, and then look back at the exposure. They're not good. Um, they're not good for rare exposures. For the same reason that cohort studies weren't good for rare outcomes. A major weakness, and I'll spend more time on this when I talk about it, is selection bias, recall bias, which we've already talked about. Particularly if you're asking the women, it's much better if you can to go back to notes to collect information that was collected at the time that the notes were made, so you're never before the outcome, so you're not reliant on the outcome influencing the recording of the exposure. Confounding uh, uh, is a major problem for co cohort studies, a bigger problem than it is for case, uh, confounding is a big problem for case control studies more than for cohort studies in general, but the specifics will vary. And finally, I think it's finally, a randomised control trial. Randomised control trials are a form of cohort study. Where you're following up the exposure or the not exposure to outcome. But in this instance, you are deciding who is exposed and who is not exposed. But otherwise, it's a form of cohort study. Always prospective, obviously, because you're deciding the exposure. The simplest way, again, to think about this, most people think about it as a drug versus a placebo, but you can have multi-armed trials, you can have all sorts of different trial designs, but the way to think about it conceptually is a drug versus a placebo, I find. So why do we use trials? Well, this is the joy of trials. It's the least biased way of assessing the evaluation, evaluating the effects of an intervention. Why? Because there is no confounding. There is no confounding. So I've talked about confounding in terms of exposures that we can measure. What about exposures we don't even think about? Potential factors, confounding factors that we don't even think about. We can't control for those in the analysis, can we? We don't collect the data. Or the data aren't available for us to control for confounding. The brilliant thing about randomization is it controls for all confounding, known or unknown. If your trial is big enough, whether you have a tortoise at home called Freddy will be distributed equally between the two groups. Yeah? And if it's not, it's by chance alone. It's not selected, that distribution. So all known and unknown confounders are controlled for. So randomized control trials are an incredibly powerful tool for getting to the truth about whether this exposure causes this outcome. This is where we don't make value judgments about causality because it's in the study design. Uh, I think the thing we forget about uh, uh, randomized trials because we think about drugs is that everything we do to a patient is an intervention and could be evaluated to find out whether there are, there are harms and benefits associated with it. Everything we do. Uh, giving a drug, giving information, we can do randomised trials about information giving. Uh, providing care during labour, uh, most of antenatal care is an intervention. We're doing something to people. We are screening and you can randomise whether to screen or not to find out its impact. So there is no confounding because allocation is by chance, so there's no selection. And although we often talk about it being like the toss of a coin, that's not allowed. You're not allowed to use toss of a coin as a method of randomization. That's not considered reasonable. There are lots of different types of study designs, and I'll touch on some of this when we're talking in more detail about randomized controlled trials. But the ones we think about are the parallel group trials with two groups. That's the majority of trials. Something like 80 odd percent of trials reported in the literature are two group parallel design. But you can have many more than two groups. You can have factorial trials, cluster randomized controlled trials, crossover trials non-inferiority trials, equivalence trials, all sorts of different trial designs. Cluster randomized step wedge designs I was talking about yesterday. It's a joy to work out. Um, we'll come back and touch on some of those in more detail. Um, the quality of trials, a lot of attention goes on to the quality of trials. Um, 
A lot of the debate about randomized controlled trials rests on issues to do with the quality of the trial. And quality isn't an abstract concept in trials. When you're doing a randomized trial of a new intervention, you're often looking for a very modest effect. Most drugs, most interventions don't halve the risk of an adverse outcome. There's very few contemporary interventions that have that big an effect. So usually you're looking for quite a small effect. Issues to do with allocation concealment and masking. Allocation concealment is ensuring that the patient or the, and the doctor cannot guess what the next allocation will be. So if you're sitting in clinic and you've managed to recruit three patients to your trial, you cannot guess what the next one's going to get. That's absolutely key. If that's poor, and if, and if there's no masking, and it's, that's used to be called blinding, you may still hear it called blinding. There was a very nice paper in the BMJ a few years ago from the ophthalmologist, very upset, that we called drugs double blind when we were talking about eye disease. But anyway, so the, the term, the, the PC term now is masking. If you don't have masking or allocation concealment, your effect size may be exaggerated by 40%. That's often bigger than the effect size you're actually looking for for the intervention. So the bias by not doing your trial properly may be huge. And that's suggesting that your intervention is effective. So there's lots of good examples now showing that that impact of quality is a very real concept which can distort the findings and the results. So that's what I've uh, talked about, allocation, concealment, and uh, masking. Now you can have double, single, triple, people talk about all ways of masking and who, and who it's important for. Clearly if you've got a placebo, it's relatively easy because neither the caregiver nor the patient knows what they're getting. But if it's a surgical intervention, if it's surgery versus not surgery, then clearly lots of people know. And some people will go to extraordinary lengths to mask. There's a very famous trial where they were injecting fetal stem cells into the substantia nigra, deep in the brain, in patients with severe Parkinson's. And in the control group, they drilled a hole in the skull, they stuck a big needle deep into the substantia nigra and injected saline. Interesting informed consent. I've never seen that leaflet, but it'd be interesting to see how that was constructed. But some people will go to extraordinary lengths to ensure that there's masking. So the effect that you're seeing is really due to the intervention. Um, and there's two reasons why masking is very important. Sometimes it's not important. Sometimes it's wrong to mask. So it does depend on the question you're asking. Don't always assume that you should have a placebo or a trial should be masked. Sometimes it would be the wrong thing to do. But the reasons we do it is because of this thing about observer bias. So if, uh, if you're asking somebody to say whether the patient is better or not, and they know whether the patient got the treatment or not, they may answer depending on their belief about the effectiveness of the intervention. And it's the same with the patient, which is why sometimes it's wrong to blind, because actually, mask. Because actually, you want the patient to tell you whether they feel better or not. And their knowledge that they got the treatment or not may be actually what you're getting at, depending on the nature of the intervention. So a low-risk intervention for a non-life-threatening condition, which improves the uh, experience for the, for the woman, might be important. Does that make sense? As opposed to trying to mask it so that you find out whether the intervention really, really does work or not as opposed to whether the woman feels better as a consequence of the intervention. And also co-interventions. So if, uh, if clinicians believe that this new treatment works, and they know that these women aren't being exposed to that new treatment, they may use other things for those women, because they're not getting the treatment. Um, and it also applies to outcome assessment. Um, I mean, this is how you, how you overcome some of these issues, if you really can't mask. You can make the outcome assessment as objective as possible. We did a trial of ECMO. ECMO is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. It's heart, lung bypass in newborns, term newborns. But you have to stick these damn big tubes into their jugular, artery, and vein. So these children are left with scars on their neck. And we followed them up at five, and we had these specially designed polo necks, which were sent to the parents to put their child in and pull the polo neck up as high as they could for when the paediatrician came around to do the assessment. It's not perfect, but it was a way to try and ensure that the paediatrician didn't know 
whether the child had ECMO or not when doing the assessment of development. I'm not sure it always worked, but <laughs> increasingly though, assessments are videoed. You know, face to face developmental assessments are often videoed, so you can get some idea that the paediatrician isn't cheating and having a sneak preview. Uh, surrogate versus substantive. I want to talk a little bit about outcomes. Um, I might delay some of this longer talk until, because I want to finish it, half past five for you. Um, have you come across the term surrogate versus substantive outcomes? It's quite an important issue, this. A surrogate is something that you can measure instead of what you really want to measure. And you do that because often the surrogate either occurs before the thing you're really interested in, or is easier to measure, or happens in more people. So it makes your trial smaller. So I'll give you an example. <laughs> Gestation and delivery. How many obstetricians in the audience? How many obstetricians? Yeah, a few, a few obstetricians. We do lots of tocolytic therapy. I'm never quite sure why we do tocolytic therapy. Um, so when women present in preterm labour, we give them drugs to try and stop them contracting so that we can delay the time that the baby's born. Because gestation and delivery is a really good marker of how well the baby does. Yeah, but I'm not interested in when the woman gives birth. I'm interested in how well a baby is and how it does when it grows up. So the substantive measure is the baby's health. The surrogate is gestation at delivery. But we become so entrenched in this view that gestation at delivery is the most important thing, that all we measure is gestation at delivery. Um, and um, I'll go into that more detail another time, but we do it because gestation at delivery is something really easy to measure, isn't it? When the baby's born, we know how, how what the gestation is. Whereas if we're really interested in how well the baby is, really interested, we probably have to wait until that baby's five before we can do a detailed assessment of their cognitive function, as opposed to waiting during pregnancy. So that's a long time to wait. We'll lose lots of people. It's extremely expensive to do face-to-face -face neurodevelopmental assessments on five-year-olds all over the country. Whereas gestation at delivery is really, really easy. But there's some real good examples of that that are going completely wrong and giving you the wrong results. Um, so the association between the surrogate and the substantive may be altered by the intervention. Um, so do you know the Oracle trial? Some of you may know the Oracle trial. This was a trial done a few years ago, and I will finish after this, I promise. Stay awake a bit longer. Lots of women randomised to receive two very common antibiotics whether they presented in preterm labour with intact mem membranes or with preterm pre labour ruptured membranes. So, two big groups of women, nearly 5,000 over 6,000, randomised in a factorial design to receive antibiotics, one antibiotic, the other antibiotic, both antibiotics, or no antibiotic. Uh, these are the, the results for the timing of delivery. So, these asterisks represent the degree that this was a significant difference. So, you can see that delivery within 48 hours. Comamoxicab was great, 29% of them within 48 hours, versus nearly 40% on placebo, big difference. Deliver within seven days, no tocolytic therapy currently on the market delays birth for seven days. Comamoxicab does, 56% versus 62%, a significant difference. Erythromycin did a little bit for 48 hours, but not for seven days, but this trial wasn't sized on prolonging pregnancy. It was sized on the neonatal outcome. And for the neonatal outcomes, the composite primary outcome was a baby with either oxygen dependency, a big bleed in its brain, or dead. That was improved, 11.3% versus 14.4%, with erythromycin, no significant difference with comoxiclap. And, and I've broken this data down in a way to illustrate a point, but it's real data. Necrotizing edge colitis, 3.8% versus 2.4%. Significant finding. So I can guarantee if this trial had been 600 women, we would now all be using carmoxiclap for women with free labor rupture of the membranes throughout the developed world. We not only wouldn't be improving the outcome, we'd be damaging babies. 
because the difference between the surrogate and the substantive was decoupled by the use of the intervention. So we delayed birth, but we didn't improve the outcome of the babies. If anything, we made them worse. And we only know that because this trial was sized on the substantive outcome, and we had thousands of babies as opposed to a few hundred. There are lots of lessons like this around in medicine. And I'm not saying it's always, but for, for surrogate, substitute the word biomarker. It's huge activity now to identify biomarkers for using in trials. The same problem occurs all the time. We don't know whether the biomarker will still retain its association with the outcome once you introduce the intervention. And if the trials are sized on the biomarker, we'll never find out. That's what I've just said. And I'm not going to go into sample size and power because we'll do that another time. Enough. So the subsequent talks I'm going to give are our cohort studies, one on cohort studies, one on case control studies, one on randomized control trials, and one on screening. So I'll go into all those in a bit more detail. Okay. Any questions now that I can answer? Desperate to go home? <laughs> Okay? Great. Thank you. Thank you.